When I mention magic, what do you think is the most stereotypical image that comes to people's minds? Sawing a woman in half has to be one of the first pictures that most people think of. In this episode, we're going to explore this iconic illusion as told by author Mike Caveney in his book, 100 Years of Sawing. But not only that, we'll talk about the lessons that we can learn from its history. If you're like me, you're thinking, well, what relevance does something like sawing in half have to do with us? I mean, this is a really old trick. True, but the question, like any good historical situation, is what can we learn from it today? And that's what makes this book and this subject so fascinating. According to the author of the book, Mike Caveney, this book is not only about the fascinating history of this illusion, it's also a history of magic itself. Infighting among magicians, legal battles, theft, backbiting, progress, marketing campaigns, money, greed, and metaphor. And let me tell you, this is some story. But don't forget, there are lessons for us today, and I will dissect what I picked up from this book later on in the episode. But first, let's talk about the book. The physical characteristics of it, what exactly are you getting? This is a pretty monstrous book about this iconic illusion. And yes, while it only covers one topic, you're getting so much more than that. This book, published by Mike Caveney's Magic Words, is 440 pages of thick, heavy paper. The paper is slightly glossy, so the full color layout really pops from the page. It also gives it quite a bit of heft. This isn't uncomfortably heavy, say, as a Miracle Factory book or talk about tricks, but it does have quite a bit of weight to it. Part of what makes up that weight are the over 360 photographs included. There's everything from lithographs and posters full of old and delightful advertisements, as well as pictures of correspondence between the magicians and sometimes their attorneys. This, in my opinion, is the best way to learn magic history. It's not a text-dense book. In fact, as you flip through the book, you're going to see that it's lavishly decorated. There's bits of color and texture and interesting things with great captions that describe exactly what you're looking at. By the time you're done reading, you'll have an understanding of exactly how this illusion works and its many iterations. All in all, this really is a gorgeous and easy to read book. Mike Caveney, the author, is well qualified to write this book. He's widely known as a magic historian and indeed owns one of the largest collections of magic history out there Egyptian Hall Museum. He's written and produced a number of books on the subject of the history of magic, including his classic correspondence series, which are letters between magicians from around the world. I've talked about the layout and the pictures, but what actually is included in the book? This book was released on the 100-year anniversary of the Sawing Illusion, which is really cool. It includes a history of the contentious nature of the origin. There's plenty in the book about all of the rip-offs and debate over who actually came up with this. The illusion itself was appropriated by many others and performed without permission, much to Horace Golden's chagrin. There were legal battles as well as marketing campaigns against other magicians who were performing the illusion in its many formats. But beyond just the history of the trick itself, Mr. Caveney walks us through how this impacted magic during a very formative time period period of the vaudeville era. You'll be introduced to all of the key players, who were the people that were performing and known by crowds back in that time. What kind of performers were they? You'll get to know a little bit about their character. It's fascinating reading. Not only that, the erudite readers studying this book will also get educated on the events of the time, the guilds that were involved in these vaudeville circuits, and the somewhat coercive nature of being a performer at that time. And if you're like me, where you've mostly studied close-up magic or cards or other things, this is a great first step into the world of illusion. To understand exactly how these big boxes work and why audiences find them so fascinating. The author throughout offers commentary and shares his considerable knowledge about all of these versions of the illusion, what makes them work, what makes them deceptive, why they're good, whether this was a step back, and all along this story is told in a very narrative and compelling way so that you aren't going to get bored. This book is fairly easy to pick up and put down, so if you have a few minutes, you can read a little bit. There's a nice index in the back so that you can look up some of your favorite performers, as well as a beautiful table of contents as he walks through the history and iterations of the illusion 
If there's a version that you saw when you were younger, or a version that has always interested you, you can just flip to that section of the book and read what the author has to tell you and see some of the beautiful pictures that he's procured to share with us, the readers. Let's talk quickly about the price. The book is $125, so this is definitely an investment. For one, you're investing in your history of magic, and as Juan Tamariz and others have written, when you know the history, somehow that comes across in your performances. People understand that you have a depth and a breadth of knowledge that isn't like the people who don't have it. Plus, you'll obviously understand some of the key lessons that are taught in here and that I want to break down for you now. Some of my key takeaways. Let's get back into the lessons that I learned from the sawing book. Why should we care about the history of sawing? I think there are some key lessons here that are important for you and for me to understand. One of them is, I don't think you necessarily have to be original in your magic to entertain an audience. When you look at the history of the sawing illusion, it was really quickly ripped off with little to no improvement. It's just however you could understand the illusion, whether you stole it, you heard about it from somebody else, you watched it on stage, and you decided to build it yourself, you were able to perform this illusion as long as you could build or afford the prop. And audiences ate it up. Now, I'm not advocating for theft. What I'm saying, though, is that when you buy a book, you read through a trick, there's a lot of pressure these days to perform original magic and to not just do something as it is out of the book. But my argument is you have to start with that. That originality is never going to be there at the beginning. It's more something that happens toward the end. Back in 1921, when this illusion was hot, it didn't matter who you were, and in fact, there are even some advertisements in here where the performer's name is left completely off. Audiences just wanted to see this illusion performed. So don't allow yourself to be intimidated by a lack of originality. Perform the tricks that you learn from the books that you have. Do them as written until, as you go along, there are going to be little pieces of yourself you're going to insert in there. So that's my encouragement, point one. The other thing that stuck out to me was that although the sawing illusion is still performed today, it certainly doesn't have the draw that it did back in 1921. Why was that? The author of Sawing alludes to the fact that people saw a lot of metaphor in this trick. There are a couple of options as to why this was so hypnotic to audiences back then. The first could have to do with women's rights. We don't know exactly, but the author explores that possibility. The 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote, was ratified in 1920. And perhaps it should come as no surprise that this sawing a woman in half appealed to some people who maybe thought that women had gone too far. Now, I don't know that that was the case, but it certainly seems plausible. On the other hand, there are also people who saw this illusion as a symbol of women breaking free from the patriarchy. And it's possible that this illusion metaphorically said something about the immortality of women and their ability to break barriers. Another possibility is that after World War I, where so many had lost their sons, husbands, brothers, other relatives, this illusion showed them that there could be hope, that when someone was put in harm's way, they could escape completely unscathed. Or it's possible that this illusion's popularity was simply due to the indulgent nature of the era and people's newfound infatuation with entertainment. Regardless, it makes for some erudite discussion. I don't think I could give you a conclusive reason why the sawing in half illusion has been popular for over 100 years. But suffice it to say, you can make up your mind for yourself if you pick up the book 100 Years of Sawing by author Mike Caveney. If you love learning about magic history, you may want to check out my video series I did on the classic correspondence books, or check out my interview with Mike Caveney about how he got into the magic publishing world. As always, my friends, I appreciate you watching. And until next time, keep reading. Hey, Lauren, you ready to practice? <laughs>